This is Reverend Don Lewis, and welcome to another episode of Living the Wiccan Life. In this episode, I'm very pleased to bring you my recent interview with Donald Michael Craig. In the interview, Donald talks about his new novel, The Resurrection Murders, his longtime friendship with the late Scott Cunningham, and how he came to metaphysics in the first place. I'm sure you'll enjoy this interview. Hello, my name is Donald Michael Craig. I'm an author, a lecturer, and all-around nuisance. <laughs> and um, we we're going to talk about a number of things this evening, including your novel. Yes. I'm very excited because uh, today is Valentine's Day, the 14th of February 2009, and my novel was released just yesterday. I will put it in front of my face so everybody can see it. It's called The Resurrection Murders. It's brand new, published by Galdi Press in Minnesota. That's G-A-L-D-E-P like Paul, R-E-S-S, -S, Galdi Press. It's the usual GaldiPress.com, too, if you're interested. And I'm really excited. Uh, novels seem to be a lot more difficult to get published than nonfiction. At least they have been for me. I think there's, that may be because there's so many people who think they are excellent novelists that uh, uh, people such as editors and publishers are just inundated with books. But uh, mine was finally accepted and I'm very excited about it. Uh, I think the people who listen to this uh, cast, this podcast or vodcast would be excited about it too because it fits in everything, the type of people who uh, I'm around and who probably watch this enjoy. Uh, it has lots of uh, magic in it. There are magical battles, there are, is uh, warfare on the astral plane, but it's not something like a lot of the magical novels that we see, read today, which is taken back in, which take place back a, a thousand or fifteen hundred years ago. This is taking place today in Southern California. And the plot is about one person who is leading a magical group and they're under attack. Uh, it's up to him to lead his new magical group, his budding magicians, to try and find out who's attacking them and stop them before somebody is hurt. Meanwhile, uh, in Hollywood, there are bodies turning up which have the infamous occult overtones. A police detective is assigned to discover who it is and stop the crimes before more are committed. And along the way, he meets crazy occultists, wacky fundamentalists. He gets bad clues, sees people who are obvious fakes and frauds, and finally realizes he's in over his depth. He calls in magicians for help. And the entire thing comes together in a massive battle on the physical plane, in, uh, on the astral plane with magic, with guns, with just about everything. Meanwhile, there's massive earthquakes in Los Angeles, killer smog, oh, and a 10,000-year-old demon who is going to be trying to take over the world. So it's exciting, it's fun, the characters uh, are really living people, at least they are to me. Uh, there's a, uh, a one section in the story where I knew it had to start here and it had to end over here and I didn't know how to do it. So what I did was I simply started the characters there and I let them talk to me and they ended up telling me, so to speak, exactly what to say and they literally worked out exactly how they should move, what they should say, what they should do to end up in exactly the right place. So you may find people who you recognize, not because this is made on real people, but because the characters are really alive and living, and I hope you'll care about them. Uh, you were telling me that um, in putting this novel together, you um, were, were drawing upon advice you'd gotten from Scott Cunningham. Yes. Uh, People may not know it, but uh, I actually shared an apartment with Scott Cunningham for several years. We were good friends, and, and I remained his friend until uh, he passed, and uh, uh, he actually passed on my birthday. I, I uh, consider that his final joke that he played on me, because every year on my birthday I'm going to have to remember him. 
he really didn't have to do that because uh, I would remember him anyway. But I told him uh, I was plotting out a novel and he gave me some good tips. Now some of your uh, uh, people watching this may not know it, but beside the nonfiction books that Scott wrote, he wrote a lot of novels, even romance novels. He frequently used his uh, uh, sister's name for that. His sister was Kathy Cunningham and he did gothic romance novels. One of the favorite ones we joked about was one which was called The Horror Hotel, uh, where it said the guests checked in, but no one got out alive, no one. And the reason why that was funny is because the only person who died in it was a uh, member of the staff, and it turned out he didn't die anyway. <laughs> but some of the tips that Scott gave me when I said that I was interested in plotting out and doing a novel, he said, make sure the characters are important. Uh, he even recommended a book to me called uh, Characters Make Your Story. And what I tried to do was really, really make characters uh, living. And the way you do that is, what uh, let me start over on that. With a, a story is a snapshot from people's complete lives. So what I did was I wrote about their entire life what came up and what happened up to the point where the story begins. Now you won't read that in the novel, but because I know all about that, I know what my characters do. The major character, for example, I know that he has long hair, that he uh, practices martial arts, that he uh, is very limber from doing yoga, and that he's a vegetarian, and that he eats in certain ways. Uh, he has certain speaking patterns and he has certain thought patterns. Uh, another character is a woman who uh, becomes one of the strongest and most important characters. I wrote her whole backstory of how she came to be the way she was. She's slightly overweight, insecure, unsure of herself, uh, afraid a lot of the time. And what happens during the story is that she keeps getting put in positions where she has to make decisions. And it's not a question of can she, but she has to. And as a result of making decisions, she finds her inner strength. She becomes stronger. Suddenly, uh, that five or ten extra pounds, it's not there anymore. It's not anything she specifically does uh, thinking, I'm going to lose weight, I'm going to become strong, but it's the way her character evolves. And the result is she continues to evolve and become stronger and stronger until she has to make what is probably the most difficult decision anybody can possibly make. Another character is a very, very lazy person. He had done everything that he could to avoid having to make a living become, uh, and get a life. He found the easiest thing that he could do was do typesetting of uh, books. Hey, this is very easy. He can sit back. He was overweight, but he finds that his lack of dedication to people around him and people he cares about has resulted in his life being unfulfilling. So he changes his life, not from outside by doing things, but from inside. And that ends up with him becoming not just somebody who sits on the back and follows along, but an actual leader. So you'll find all the characters are evolving. They all have their own speech patterns. And I don't know about you, but if you've been reading a lot of novels, you'll find that Oftentimes, the major difference between people and characters and novels is the clothes they wear. I remember seeing one novel, uh, reading one novel where the characters used the same speech patterns, the uh, same words, the same abbreviations. Everything was the same. And uh, I didn't know who was talking just from reading uh, the speech. So I tried to make individual characters who had their own motivations, their own desires, and I think when people get a chance to read it, The Resurrection Murders, uh, they're going to enjoy it because it's a lot of fun. Uh, by the way, I'm also very proud of the cover uh, because uh, th the publisher got an artist to do, I gave the idea of the yin yang symbol, which does play an important role in the book. And then they weren't able to work with the artist anymore. And 
they kept saying we're going to get an artist we're going to get an artist and i said hey send me the file and i'll do the cover so except for this uh, I did design the cover basically and uh, I did that and uh, it's fun doing covers. <laughs> <laughs> yes indeed. Well the last time I interviewed you we, we talked a lot about your work Yes. and you have a very impressive body of work but I want to ask you a very different question this time. All right. And uh, I want to ask how you came to this path. Uh, well I talk about that a little bit in uh, the beginning of Modern Magic, which is probably my most famous book, and I just happen to have a copy right here, so people uh, at home can, or in their office or wherever they are, can see it. Here I can do my Vanna White pose. <laughs> what happened was, I was brought up in conservative Judaism, and in conservative Judaism there was an attitude of well, you be nice, you come to synagogue, you say the prayers, and everything is fine. Um, science is perfect, absolutely. Do everything according to science and stuff, but just say your prayers, love God, and you'll be fine. Well, just before my bar mitzvah, I was called into the office by one of the rabbis at the synagogue. We had um, an extra rabbi because our rabbi was rather young. He was in his 40s. And they felt that they needed an older rabbi who could take care of and, and console the people who were elderly. So they got a gentleman who was about 85, 90, going on 18. Uh, he wore tennis shoes under his robes and the like. And he calls me into his office and says, Don, there's something I have to show you. And what he explained was what are called the tefillin. Now, the tefillin are things which Orthodox Jewish males wear during certain rituals. There is a small box which fits on the forehead, and it has leather straps which come around the head and come forward and hang down the upper part of the body. There is another one, another box with prayers in it, which fits on the left arm, and there's a leather strap which you wind seven times around your arm, come down onto your hand, and wrap it uh, around your hand so it forms the letter Shin, and with the way you have wrapped it, it forms the word Shaddai, which is one of the names of God. Now this just totally blew me away. I'm going, wait a second, isn't God supposed to be, you know, that four letter name that you're not supposed to pronounce? And what does this have to do with science and rationality and the like? So suddenly I started pulling away from this conservative Judaism and wondering what was going on. And that in part led me to the study of the Kabbalah and uh, the Tarot and one thing basically led to another. However, there was another aspect too, which I don't go into modern magic, but I can take time to reveal it here. My father died when I was six years old, and so I was very close to my mother and uh, also close to the synagogue, which sort of played the role as a, as a type of father. But one thing that always interested me was the paranormal. Now, uh, we had a relative who was uh, involved in a casino at Vegas. We think he may have been a part owner. And he would get us rooms that were what they call comp. That was a free room. All we had to do was get out there. We had free room. And the meals in Vegas back then, you could eat uh, like a king for like $2. I mean, it was just wonderful food for next to nothing. Well, my mother loved to play the nickel slot machines. But uh, at this time, Vegas was not very, as they say, family friendly. It's become more so and almost broke them. That's another story. But because it wasn't family friendly, there was no place for a six-year-old kid to sit. So my mother put me in a hallway so she could watch me while she was playing the slot machines. And I was just bored and nothing to do. So I said, Mom, can I please uh, pull on the handle? And she said, no, you're not allowed to gamble. And I said, well, can I put the money in then? She said, no, that's gambling. You're not allowed to gamble. <sighs> so, well, if I can't gamble out there, I'll gamble in here. And my mother looked at me, and there was a police officer watching, looked over at me. I walked over to a cigarette machine and pulled the coin return. <laughs> and $1.35 came out. And that was my first adventure in creating unusual things happening. And it seemed to me that a lot of unusual things have happened to me over my, uh, my life. Uh, years later, I, uh, I was friends with uh, 
the star, uh, excuse me, the son of a fairly famous Hollywood personality who was doing a show in Vegas. And his son and I uh, went out there and uh, his parents, uh, this star gave us a, a room to stay in. And we would gamble, we found a machine that would always pay off in small amounts. Uh, if you know uh, something about Vegas, you know there are certain machines that pay off more regularly. And then the psychology of Vegas was absolutely amazing because wherever you went, it would lead you into gambling. Well, we had a bunch of chips and we ch went to the bank uh, or the tellers to check them out and get uh, money off of them. And in order to get to our rooms after that, you have to go back through the casino. Great planning. Well, my friend reaches into his pocket and he says, oh, I've got a, another dollar chip. And I said, well, let's go back and check it out. And he said, no, let's just play a game we haven't played before. And he said, well, which one? And he said, no, oh, let's try roulette. I said, okay, so we go over to the roulette table, and he puts it down on red, and I said, don't do that. And he said, why not? He said, well, the odds are terrible. It's only 50-50. He said, well, what should I do? And I said, well, try a column. There you get three to one odds. And he said, well, which column should I put it down on? I put my hand on the table, and I said, put it on the column on the left. So he puts it on the column on the left, and it comes up the column on the left. So now he has $4, the $1 he bet, plus $3 back. He says, now what should I do with it? I put my hand on the table, close my eyes, move it to the center column. Moved it to the center column. The center column comes up. So now from four chip, one chip, he now has moved up to 16 chips, the four that he had, plus 12 more. And he says, what should I do now? close my eyes, put my hand on the table, and say, leave it. So he leaves it. It comes up the center column again. All of a sudden, I hear people screaming. And now I forget the mathematics, but he had like $40. And I look around, and now all of a sudden, there are people coming over who are starting to look and see what's going on. Police are coming over. And since my friend and I were both... Uh, underage at the time. I grabbed the chips and said, let's get out of here. But we had dinner that night and a very nice dinner as a result of that. So I've had unusual phenomena and I wanted to find out why. Why do those things happen? So these all things led me to the study of the Tarot and the Kabbalah and that led me to uh, uh, produce modern magic eventually. Oh well, I'll go on to another story. Uh, earlier today, I don't know if you've interviewed uh, interviewed him, Chris Penzak, Christopher Penzak, told his story. He was going to be a movie, uh, excuse me, a rock and roll star. And he was in line with it, he made albums, and uh, but one thing or another led to him teaching. Well, I was in shock when I heard him say that because that was very much my story too. Uh, I had expected to, I, well, when I was in college, I was doing some hypnosis work with a friend and he said, why are you here? What's your purpose? And the message that I got that I felt and I shared with him was to learn so that I can teach. And my first thought is, what the heck am I talking about? Because I was going to be a rock star. I was in bands. I opened for Elton John. I opened for Great White. I played in concerts before 10,000 people. I play keyboards, synthesizers, theremin, and a variety of other instruments. I never expected to teach. I didn't want to teach. What happened was, while I was studying music uh, at UC San Diego, I was sharing a house with some people, and there was a gentleman there who had come over, uh, who had studied uh, Oriental Massage in, uh, uh, in Korea, and he was living with us, and he said, is it okay if I teach some classes there? And he said, sure. And I said, tell you what, you can take the classes. So I went through his class. He was one of the first people in the U.S. to teach shiatsu, oriental massage. And uh, we went through the class and went through it a second time, went through it a third time. And he finally said, Don, why don't you help me with the class? And I said, okay. And so I helped him with the class and I was sort of the co-teacher. And then one day he said, Don, I'm going to be out next week. I want you to teach the class. What? Me? I can't teach the class. I don't know anything. He says, you've been through it a bunch of times. You can teach it. You can read off your notes. Well, okay. 
about halfway through the class, uh, this gentleman says, uh, Don, the class wants to talk to you. Okay. And they said, we heard that you teach, you know the Kabbalah. We'd like you to teach it to us. And I said, but I only know that much. And they said, that's okay. We only know this much. So next week, instead of teaching the appropriate class on uh, Shiatsu, I ended up teaching the Kabbalah. And that class went okay, but I could only teach that much of what I knew. So there was a, a cult shop near where we lived in Encinitas, California, which was called Phoenix Fire. And I went in and said, would you be interested in having me teach four classes? And they said, oh, we'd love it. We've been looking for a class on that. So I taught four classes and people wanted to know more. And pretty soon it was up to eight and then 10. And that's what eventually became modern magic. So that's my story and I'm sticking to it. Wonderful. People would like to find out more about you and more, more about your books and, and, and your projects, where would they go? Well, uh, you can go of course to Llewellyn and Llewellyn.com. Uh, I also am one of the writers uh, who writes the announcements that you'll find in Llewellyn's New Worlds, which you can get. I am the editor of their free online encyclopedia, all of which is available at Llewellyn.com. Uh, for more information on my novel, uh, hopefully it will soon be available at all the usual places, but you can immediately go to Galdi Press, that's G-A-L-D-E, GaldiPress.com and you can order directly through them. I'm now on Facebook. Please come and be my friend. And uh, I am getting more and more into the swing of things. Uh, Llewellyn in the near future is going to be changing their uh, website and they are going to have a lot of bloggers there uh, from of Llewellyn authors and I have been invited to be one of them. So hopefully in the near future, I will have a, a fascinating and intriguing blog on Llewellyn.com. And now one thing I wanna make sure is you did say in editing, you were going to be able to make me look like Brad Pitt. Brad Pitt. Isn't that right? <laughs> yes, indeed. Oh, uh, good, I wanted to make sure of that. So uh, those are places that you can uh, find me very easily. Uh, my email, and I invite you to write to me, is simply don at D M Craig, that's D is in Don, M is in Michael, K R A I G dot net. So please feel free to write. Now, sometimes, such as now, I'm at a convention, it may take a while for me to get back to you, but I invite people to write. Uh, again, if I can give you some uh, tips or advice or, or help, I am more than happy to do so. There is one thing that I won't do though, so I'll tell you right now. And that is, I do not do people's magic for them. I won't do a spell for you. I won't do a ritual for you. And there's a reason for that. My goal is to empower you, people who are watching this, to empower my readers. If I am doing the work for you, then I'm the one who's powerful. And you are still the victim of time, of place, of effort, of me, whether or not I'm going to do the next spell for you. Whereas if you take a look at my nonfiction books, you learn to empower yourself. You learn to make changes in your life. You make, learn to make improvements in your life. That's what I'm trying to do. I'm trying to help each and every person become as much as they possibly can. And I don't care what your situation is, what your problem is, we all have reasons that things are not going our way. We all have reasons that we don't have a good job. The economy is bad. Uh, they didn't like me. They don't like my religion. My hair's too long. My hair's too short. My skin's too light. My skin's too dark. I'm too thin, too tall, too heavy, too, too uh, whatever. There's another name for reasons. That name is Excuse. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for giving me a chance to say, hi, boy, I feel like the, the doctor on The <laughs> Simpsons when I do that. Hi, everybody. <laughs> I hope that you enjoyed this interview and that you'll join us again next time for more of Living the Wiccan Life. Until then, may you blessed be. And don't forget our books, Witch School First, Second, and Third Degree, 
Ritual and Therian Practice, and Living the Wiccan Life. Available now at a bookstore near you, or get them direct from us at www.witchschoolstore.com.